that's for my old coin. I'm sorry I stopped and I restart, but uh, let's pick up on this point an Oxford was revolutionary. And uh, the question, as I posted earlier on, why Oxford were involved at this level uh, and engaged so much in uh, discussion with politicians and they uh, learned so much uh, political theology. And there are three reasons I want to highlight very briefly. Uh, first of all, uh, that Knox feared for his own country. He was uh, not only a churchman but a patriot. And there was real danger at this point of uh, going to become an annex uh, on the Kingdom of France. Remember that at this time the, the Queen Regent was Mary of Guise, who had close uh, bonds with the court of France. There was a French army that staged garrison in Leith and uh, all the main positions in the uh, civic, uh, civic life uh, went to Frenchmen and so too did uh, the senior persons in the very church itself. Her brother, uh, Colonel Lorraine, was a bishop, uh, I think, of Mel Rose. So Mary was very much concerned to, to uh, bring Scotland uh, fully uh, within uh, France's sphere of influence. But there was something even deeper than that, and in some ways less overt, less open, and that was that uh, Queen Mary was sent to France uh, at a very, very early age, I think she was only six years of age, and she was promised in marriage to the Dauphin, uh, the heir to the French throne, and all that was kind of public, but there was also an agreement uh, which was less so that uh, the Dauphin would have had the title of King of Scotland, and in the event of Mary died childless, uh, the session would pass, would pass uh, to the French royal house. And uh, Knox, I think, had some uh, knowledge of this, but he certainly uh, worried very much about the prospect uh, of uh, Scotland being becoming, as I said, an annex uh, of France, a very real danger as it was at the time. In fact, even uh, post 1707, there was a real danger in the Jacobite rising of the early 18th century. So that's part of Knox's concern, not really a judgment, but a patriot. The other concern uh, that Knox had was that the Reformation, as he saw it, would never be established without the support of the state. Uh, that may seem to us, even joining us today, uh, close to heresy, because of a very uh, deep anti constantinian sentiment uh, woven into a current ideology. That, in many ways, troubles me greatly because Constantine was in some ways the church's saviour in the 4th century. I think we lose sight of the persecution that the church suffered in the first three centuries under the Roman Empire. And uh, Eusebius tells how horrendous those persecutions were. And they came, I think, close to uh, extending the church altogether. That may seem uh, odd to us, but remember that the Islamic invasions uh, of the 7th century did in fact liquidate the Christian faith in the Middle East. And uh, the pre constitutional persecutions almost did the same. And Constantine comes in a part of all this, he gives a, the church protection to an end to the reign of terror, and in that way uh, ensures uh, or survival in some relative peace and safety. But that's not the whole, that was Knox's. And Knox's position was this. He looked around him and he saw that in other countries such as uh, France and uh, Spain and Italy, uh, the Reformation had not succeeded because the state had not supported it. And that was very, very obvious. And uh, he knew that uh, if the state and the person of Mary of Guise were to uh, win the struggle in uh, 1560-1559, the Reformation was doomed because uh, she would deal with the Protestants as the French were dealt with them in France. In fact, in the year that Knox dies, 1572, uh, there was a, mas a massacre of Protestants in the St. Holiday's Day Massacre, and uh, that uh, damaged the Reformed Church in France uh, almost irreparably, and, and Knox literally feared for a notion of blood in the event uh, of uh, 
the France taking over and the state not supporting the Protestant cause because there was no, the terms were, were quite stark, either persecution or protection. And so Knox needed uh, the state uh, support for his reformation. The third factor was this, Knox's own personal convictions and temperament. Knox was a Democrat, but Knox was also uh, convinced personally uh, of the legitimacy of resisting the despotic power and tyranny. He maintained, and had said so publicly in 1558, <coughs> that uh, the people had a right to depose tyrants uh, and those who abused their authority. And so Knox came to Scotland uh, with that principle fixed very firmly in his mind, the right to resist tyranny. Now, this comes out in Mary's first, uh, Knox's first encounter with Mary in 1561. Uh, a bare 16 days after arrived in Scotland, she sends for Knox, which is very interesting because uh, she must have deemed him a person of some uh, significance when she sent so uh, soon for him and summoned him to the palace. And uh, there's a whole mythology uh, surrounding those uh, Knox Mary discussions or debates. And uh, it's often uh, assumed that uh, Knox uh, uh, terrorized this little slip of a girl. Now, Knox was much more courteous to me than was Andrew, Andrew Melville, for example. But, but bear in mind that Mary was not a slip of a girl. Uh, Mary of Scots was, I was sure, I don't know who measured her, but she, I'm sure she was 5 feet 11 inches tall. And for the age, that was exceedingly tall even for a man. The average Scot was small, and Knox was small by the standards of the average Scot. So we have a wee man Knox confronted uh, by this sixteenth uh, century Lady Diana, uh, elegant, gorgeous, tall, and also an extremely able woman. Mary was well educated, spoke several languages, schooled in French diplomacy, a very, very poor politician she was, as it turned out, but she was a very good diplomat. And uh, Knox was not always a match for her. And uh, I don't feel at all sorry for Mary in the income. She had in many ways uh, all the advantages. It would be like me going to argue with Mrs. Thatcher. It was fairly uh, uneven, uh, that kind uh, of encounter, and I guess I don't have Knox's guts or Knox's courage. So that's the context. And she says to Knox on this first encounter, Think you, she said, that uh, subjects having power may resist their princes. And Knox answers unhesitatingly, Yes, madam, the princes do exceed their bounds. And I suppose that Mary Blanche didn't speak to a French uh, uh, princesses in that particular way. And Knox continues famously, uh, Princes <coughs> have no more power than fathers and mothers. And should a father is said to be opening away a frenzy and take a knife to his children, then the other children may bind together and restrain him until the frenzy is past. Restrain and disarm until the frenzy is past. It is even so, madam, almost madam, it is even so, madam, with princes that would murder the children of God. They may be restrained uh, and disarmed uh, to protect uh, those said children. So Knox is unambivalent uh, on this principle. There is another moment later on when again uh, we have a Mary and Knox confrontation or conversation. And uh, Mary, irritated by Knox's lack of obsequiousness, says to Knox, And what are you within this realm? And he answers in the democratic spirit, 
a subject, madam, born within the same. And though I be neither heir, lord, nor baron, yet am I, by God's grace, how abject soever I may seem in your eyes, a profitable member within the same. And what we have here is divine image, speaking on equal terms to divine image, not king or queen and subject, but the equality of man with man and man with woman. That's what we have there. And that accounts for Knox's willingness uh, to uh, confront the powers that be and to make plain that in certain situations it is the people's right to resist, to defy and to depose. And that remains in Scottish theology right down through the centuries. It's there in Andrew Melville, uh, it's uh, there uh, in uh, Robert Bruce, it's there with Samuel Henderson, Samuel Rutherford, it's there in Brown and Womfrey, in James Wedding and uh, uh, Richard Cameron, uh, John Witherspoon who goes off to America with the same principles in his uh, head and signs of his independence, he would be minister to do so. There shall seed sown, a democratic seed that will uh, eventually bear fruit uh, in uh, the democracy we know uh, in Britain and America uh, today. Now it's not the only factor, there are other factors too in case you think of course some bad things. There's also the work of men like John Locke in England which is also important from a different point of view. Uh, but uh, Knox is here enunciating what had been suggested by John Major, which had been sometimes uh, adumbrated by very evil thinkers, but which is here being said face to face. Now, others have said it, and we can say it, but there's one in my difference, it could have cost Knox's head. And despite that, he still says it. He bears his testimony uh, to the legitimacy uh, of resisting uh, tyrants' uh, authority. I want to move on to reflect on Knox as radical in some other directions. Uh, there are three of those that I think I want to explore at time allows. One is Knox as church organiser, and uh, this comes up particularly in uh, the book of Discipline, uh, of which Knox was only a co-author. Uh, it took a long time to prepare, uh, never ratified by Parliament, and published uh, only a uh, century afterwards in Holland. Uh, at that, it was so much. Uh, deplored uh, by Scott and Stuart families because of its radical uh, arrangements with regard to the church lands. I'm not going to in detail except to highlight this one fact that uh, Knox is concerned to give us a, a total organisation for the church because organisation mattered. In Geneva, Calvin does the same with his ordinances and so on. Uh, Thomas Sharma also later on uh, an organiser as well. The piece of position is this, and it's not always uh, to our comfort today, but I see it nonetheless, that Knox and Calvin viewed the church as the organ of the kingdom of God. And it was the church's responsibility uh, to evangelize the world, to plant churches, to uh, uh, set up missions, to select its ministers, to train its ministers, to exercise its It was a total Christian movement. The, 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 the kingdom moved ecclesiastically. And Knox wanted that uh, organization perfected. It's going to be a fit for its purpose. It was to be entirely an ecclesial, a church-led, and church-directed movement. 
Now, having said that, Knox was also aware, as were well his contemporaries, that uh, they were living in unsettled times. And uh, that's why we have, for example, superintendents, uh, for which there is no biblical warrant, as Knox allowed. Uh, but in the circumstances, Knox thought that this was appropriate. There was a great dearth of ministers, uh, there were huge parishes, uh, church buildings were in a deplorable state. And so we have this office, uh, in inverted commas, uh, created uh, for this particular emergency. The principle is validated by, the, by the, the Assembly of 1646, which adopts the Lord Confession of Faith, uh, because it says that uh, there are some principles in the, in the Confession uh, an anti church government uh, and an end the, the King's White Convene the Assembly, which apply only to Turks not settled. And that's what Knox had a church not settled. Head superintendents who are not bishops in our sense of the word, uh, but are primarily itinerant preachers with enormous areas to cover. One area, if I recall correctly, uh, embraced uh, Sutherland, Ross, Louise and Skye. And one man had to ensure that there was gospel preached in throughout those enormous areas. The plan uh, was to have uh, ten superintendents in the event uh, only five were appointed and they were never replaced when they retired uh, or fell by the wayside. But the, the principle is simply this, that uh, when uh, there are a set of conditions then you may take particular uh, emergency measures to deal with that situation. Now Knox, as I said, covered the whole range uh, of the church's challenges uh, calling ministers, training ministers, bringing up the young people, care for the poor. All of these things were the remit of the church itself. It would have been hard to understand our situation today where we have such a, a broken, fragmented church and such a disunified uh, Christian uh, endeavour. The second area I wanted to reflect on perhaps in some more detail is education. Uh, which again uh, Knox deals with in the first book of Discipline, and which is seen by many uh, as Knox has made a contribution uh, to, the, to the Scottish uh, life and culture. Knox's starting point is to be called, the starting point was this, that fathers should not be allowed to use their children according to their own fantasy or their own fancy. It's a rebuke to myself because I've been so irritated by the plans for children to have uh, adults, assigned, adult, uh, adults assigned to them from the earliest age. And uh, uh, this intrusion, as, we, as I saw it, uh, into parental rights and into the private lives of families. And here is Mr. Knox undermining my position to some extent. <laughs> but the language is so fascinating. They do not have the right to use their children according to their own private fancy, but must have them educated for the benefit not of the father but of the church and the commonwealth. That's Knox's starting point. He goes on from there uh, to describe uh, universal and compulsory education. Every child must go to school. Whether the father wants it or not, every child must go to school. And one remarkable thing is that Ideally, Knox, that's from the age of seven to the age of 24. Not in school all the time, but education before that very extended period. 
And to that end, uh, the book of Nisman ordains that uh, there must be a schoolmaster attached to every single church. Each church must have a schoolmaster qualified to teach grammar and the Latin language. Uh, and he was on then uh, from that point to elaborate a program uh, of comprehensive education embracing rich and poor right up to a university standard. Uh, first of all, there is the primary level uh, where uh, you have two years uh, devoted to learning to uh, read and above all to read the Catechism and then you have some four years of what we would call secondary education where they uh, are going to learn the rudiments uh, of the grammar which uh, will mean Latin grammar and perhaps perfect those uh, in that four year period so they learn the language is at a very very early age and then we have uh, the, what I would call perhaps a college phase, the intermediate phase uh, between school and university where there, is, uh, there are to be colleges of says in every notable town. <coughs> Primary grade, secondary grade and then high school. And in those high schools uh, they are prepared for university. And then university which again uh, in Knox's mind, Knox's mind uh, functions at two distinct levels. First of all, there is a mandatory course in the arts, which includes uh, things like the Greek and uh, logic and rhetoric. And public speaking was very important at this point uh, in the Reformation. Uh, and then after that, after the arts degree, uh, they will proceed to a professional course in medicine, in law, or in divinity. That is, if a stock says, they're <coughs> docile, and I love that word, uh, they're teachable. In other words, there is a kind of selection built into this. Not everybody uh, is docile in the sense of being fit for higher learning. Now, is that an elitist? I'm not going to say it's a lot of that in one case, it might cost me too much. But uh, that was Knox's concern. And if they were docile, they had no option, from Knox's point of view, but to undergo the program. Uh, the, the wealthy, uh, they were required uh, to take this program of education, partly because Knox and Calvin took a dim view of the behaviour of those who had inherited wealth and to live dissolute lives. And so the children of the rich uh, should be required to undergo this rigorous education program. But so too should the children of the poor. The problem was, how could they fund that? And Enoch said, they will be supported <coughs> and sustained at the charge of the church. The church would pay to educate these children from primary, secondary, high school, university, professional. Now, you will see as a consequence that there are uh, university registers which uh, have, besides certain names in the register, uh, Dives and uh, Pauper, rich or poor, who paid and who didn't pay, whose fees were paid for them. And that's going back uh, to the 16th century, 615, 661, Knox has this enormously innovative program. But this magnificent vision of a compulsory copies of education right down to the age of 24. Now, of course, those who were not docile would leave school around 13 and they would learn a craft. And this too didn't allow Knox for much discretion. Not that the father wanted it, but somehow this must be accommodated. And I think that even when I stand this one, that is such a challenging mission. Not least in regard to those who are not docile. That there should be provision whereby 
Uh, every school leaver who is not docile, not uh, concerned, not apt, shall I say, for academic, uh, higher academic learning, would be by statute and at the state's or the church's expense taught a craft. And all this goes on to the age, at least to the early 20s. That is Knox's mission. Now let me add this to it, that Knox was not thinking in isolation, because Knox never did. Remember how much Knox had travelled in uh, France and uh, Switzerland and England, the contacts Knox, Knox had uh, with uh, Strasbourg and Busser and so on. And there was a ferment at this time in educational uh, theory all over Europe. Going back to the rest, Renaissance humanism had bred this fascination, this, this passion for educational theory and practice. And all the reformed churches had caught uh, this particular uh, bug, if I may call it. And uh, you have it in Geneva, you have it uh, in Lausanne, you have it in Zurich, you have it in Strasbourg, you have it in Nîmes in France, you have it all over Europe. You have this uh, discussion of the best way to educate, the best schemes, the best practices, all this is a ferment uh, which Knox is overhearing and which Knox can consult and take advice. And so here is this we Scotsman uh, producing this tremendous vision for us uh, in consultation with uh, the whole of post Renaissance Europe and it is, my view, a magnificent vision which we did well, which we are not yet caught up with today. Now, uh, it remained but a vision, only a dream. It was a program. I didn't get beyond that for centuries. It didn't get beyond it because, most importantly, Scotland's noble families grabbed all the church lands and took to themselves all the revenues which Knox had assumed would become the revenues of the church. In the event, scarcely any of those revenues ended up in the church's coffers. And so there was no funding for schoolmasters, or school buildings, or schoolmaster houses, or funding above all to give bursars, bursaries to poor children. Now, I'm not going to say what I think to the beauty of Scotland's noble families, uh, but this is not noble. This is the grabbing of the church lands. Now it happened in England too, not confined to Scotland. But this is largely why the, the vision remained only a vision. The other problem was that despite the vision, uh, this book of this was never in fact uh, approved by Parliament uh, and furthermore the Assembly of the Church never passed any executive order requiring churches uh, to build schools and schoolmasters houses and provide for schoolmasters uh, stipends. There was a vision but no executive order. Now, in 1696, that changes when Parliament does pass an act, and it's Parliament that does it, requiring uh, the uh, uh, heritors and landowners to provide A, a school building, B, a schoolmaster's house, and C, a salary for the schoolmasters. And now there was an executive order, and things began to improve. Yet they began to improve only slowly. And uh, very gradually, and there are still huge areas which have no education provision uh, at all. Uh, it's very well to think of a school in every parish, but how big were those parishes? Some were enormous. The whole of Mr. Ross were in a parish school. The uh, other Lewis had uh, perhaps the time three parishes in Stormway, uh, Locks and Dewey, enormous distances over Loch River and Moor, miles and miles. You couldn't possibly have walk to school uh, over these distances. 
uh, and so forth. Well, the number of parish schools grows. The parish school is still indicated of the level of education provision because of the size of those parishes. In fact, by around 1815, I'm told, there were twice as many children being taught in private schools as in parish schools. And when Chalmers goes in John's parish in Glasgow in the 1820s, he has to, in fact, build two schools, well, one building, two schools, and one building, and find two schoolmasters and begin the arrangements from the ground upwards because there was no provision. Uh, we know so much, you know, about the terrible state we're in Scotland today, I think we forget. We have never been anything but in a dreadful state. I don't know if I can come back to this or not. It just disturbs so much. We feel we had a great golden age. When Chalmers went to the throne, his, his uh, perception was that his own Chalmersian language said only one hundredth part of the population sat in church. We were, is two percent the cut off point? Only one percent in a Glasgow parish in the 1820s who sat in church. And no school uh, in Glasgow, despite all uh, the arrangements made, the Mission of Knox and the Act of 1696, and the push of the private schools. And Charles had had to, uh, to raise money locally from his own friends, a hundred pounds from himself. Uh, and others likewise to provide the school and the house and the schoolmaster for this particular parish in what was then a thriving industrial class school, though these stems not of course thriving at all. So there is the way it panned out. The other problem was that uh, there was no permission made to educate teachers. Now, I say educate because I gather that uh, in modern education faculties, the word training is taboo. You can't speak, you cannot train teachers. You can only educate them, but I agree with that. You can't train this kind of profession. But there was no provision taught educated teachers. And there are also a man, a forgotten man, called David Stowe, uh, one of Chalmers's uh, boys in Glasgow, and uh, David Stowe was a successful businessman, a son of a successful businessman, and he, as he walked to work every day, he was going through slum streets and seeing all these children, and their deplorable condition, physically and morally, and he knew that there was only one provision made from that was Sunday school, an hour a week out of seven days, and he said, this will never do. So he began to establish a school of his own, and that ran into all kinds of setbacks and difficulties and so on. Uh, although he did persevere. Now, now Stowe was an amazing man. Stowe, for example, disapproved of corporal punishment in schools. Stowe awarded no prizes. School emphasized the importance of the playground and of play for education. And Stowe emphasized, we want to produce not decent law abiding citizens, but well-developed personalities but still no provision for educating teachers. Uh, Stowe works on this with friends and eventually in 1837 there is set up in Glasgow, I think in Dundas Street if I'm not mistaken, uh, there is set up there the first normal school in Scotland and Britain and perhaps the whole of Europe to educate teachers. Uh, for a reason I won't go into, uh, Stowe lost that school to the Church of Scotland. Well, I can tell you why. He had to go to the government for financial support. The government said yes, but only if you hand over the buildings to the church to the established church, which Stowe did. And in 1843, uh, the church, of course, kept the building and expelled 
uh, all the free church trainees who were there and uh, therefore uh, Stowe had to provide some alternative uh, provision uh, facilities for educating teachers. The result is that there were two free church normal colleges, one in Glasgow and in Edinburgh. Uh, the actual sequence of events in Glasgow not all that clear about. There was a Stowe College in it not that long, 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 long ago. But Jordan Hill College runs in that succession, uh, in the Stowe succession. Uh, the South Clyde facility, the Glasgow facility, runs in a different tradition than the Catholic tradition, and different thing altogether. And then in Scotland, in Edinburgh, the Mary, Mary House was uh, set up, with the Lord called Mary House, first of all, but the, the Free Church acquired Mary House, the building, in 1848. And uh, it uh, taught its own Free Church teachers there. In 1872, you've got the Education Act, which makes education compulsory. There's a mushrooming uh, of uh, uh, demand for teachers, but they are still trained in these old church colleges, the Free Church one and Mary House, until I think 1907. Now, Mary said, No, there is a Free Church Foundation. You should sometimes remind them that, that is, you know, not only where the money came from, but also where the ideas came from in the first place. Sorry, being sectarian and international uh, on such an important matter. But it's a fascinating story and a vision of which I am immensely proud. Going back to Knox, through Charles David Stone, Murray House, uh, all along the line you know, of this primal uh, Noxian vision. The other area I wanted just to reflect on briefly is Knox as revolution in terms of worship and the group of common order. Now, it's important, and in some ways I'm in troubled waters on this one, but then Knox was often troubled water. The insistence of the reformers on a common order. The Church of England and the Church in Scotland, the Church in Geneva, the Church in Frankfurt, there was an agreed order of service. The one that uh, became Knox's uh, liturgy uh, was first used by John Calvin in Geneva, uh, known as the Geneva Service Book. It was also used by Knox uh, in Frankfurt and then adopted in Scotland in 1562. So it's difficult to be going to look up uh, Knox's liturgy in Lang's works of Knox, you will find uh, a separate version of this order distinct from that used in Geneva and in Frankfurt. Uh, there was a separate uh, Scottish edition in 1565, complete with psalms approved for use in public worship, and so it came to be called the Psalm Book. So it was under all kinds of names the Service Book, the Knox Liturgy Book of Common Order, and the Psalm Book all refer uh, to the same thing. Now, this psalm book contains <coughs> uh, an order for public worship, which is fascinating because that in Knox's order, the service begins not with a, with a welcome but with a confession of sins. Because that's where I guess the revelation started with the awareness of our own sins, so the service begins. So I'm not saying that's the best place to start, but at least that's where they started. And that's where they all started. Every minister, exhorter, and reader would use this service and begin with a confession of sins. Now there was a, a form of words uh, indicated for that confession of sins, but it was not prescribed. You didn't you need to use those words. Knox would say very often, uh, uh, or such like. But they're suggestions. This prayer, or some such like, uh, confessing uh, sin. And then it proceeds through the readings and uh, the singing of the Psalms uh, to the sermon. After the sermon, uh, there is a prayer. And it's a prayer for the state of Christ's church. And it's very, very relevant. And I am going to suggest to you that every single Lord's Day you should have this prayer in your liturgy. <coughs> now, I think there should be a common liturgy. 
if I can digress for a moment, when, when uh, Alexander Henderson went to London to the Westminster Assembly, he got fed up hearing from his English brethren that in Scotland, each minister conducted worship according to his own extemporary fancy. And uh, Henderson was so irate about that, he wrote a brilliant pamphlet uh, on the Ordinary Government of the Church of Scotland, which is on the Free Church website, at least I think it is. And uh, he was saying, we do not behave in that way. We have an order, we have a look of common order. And uh, that at the sanction uh, of the General Assembly. So we have this, uh, the, the prayer after the ceremony. And there are two remarkable things about it from a, from a puritanical point of view. Uh, one is the use of the Lord's Prayer at the, well, at the end of the service. And it's a prayer, I should say. Uh, the, the prayer ends with the Lord's Prayer. Century, Thompson tried to revive it with success in the early 19th century. The objection being that you can't expect a mixed multitude to, to say, Our Father will chart in heaven because God's not their Father. Now, I'm not sure that the Reformers thought about congregation as a mixed multitude. But the prayer, can you see the Lord's my shepherd? This is Tore. You've heard it very various this time and again about when a friend of mine, the Reverend Kenneth McRae, uh, was going home one night with his car and he comes across uh, a drunkard in a ditch. And uh, the, the drunkard is spat into his car, was a very, very caring man. And as he saw the collar of Mr. McRae, the stubby clerical collar, he began to sing, The Lord's my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd. And Mr. McRae said, Be what is the Lord is not your shepherd, or you won't be in the ditch. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, we can't have this argument. No Lord's Prayer but the 23rd Psalm, because they both raise the same difficulty. So the Lord's will become an integral part of the service. And why not? Because it's so hugely important that our worship should be not only confessional, and pastoral, but also Catholic, uniting us with the whole Church of God worldwide. This is about the state of Christ's Church. And so, yes, Knox would sanction, would demand, would in fact ordain the use of the Lord's Prayer uh, in public worship. Also, the use of the Creed uh, in public worship. Uh, at the same point, this prayer after the ceremony, they would recite the, the prayer and the Apostles' Creed. And this, how at least they gained an elementary knowledge of the great articles of Christian faith, which our young folk today do not possess, because they don't do the Creed. They don't know what they believe. Now there it was, but also when it came to baptism, Knox did not put to the parent, the father, uh, a vow. But he got the man, or the sponsor, to recite the Apostles' Creed. That was, again, say the belief. That's all it's put, say the belief. <coughs> and the man said the belief, and on that basis, uh, was given the privilege of having his child uh, baptised. Though I digressed. If I go back to where I digressed from, I was at the point when I was speaking about uh, the prayer of the sermon and the allusion to the persecuted church. And so every Sunday in Scotland, by stipulation of the assembly, they remembered the persecuted church and the language is very beautiful. It includes the words, remember those who are in prison and those who are under sentence of death. So each Lord's Day in every Scottish church, let's remember the persecuted and those in prison 
are those under sentence of death. And Knox's book of common order would not let you forget, because every day they were on the agenda. The other point I wanted just to refer to briefly is Knox's order for the Lord's Supper, which again uh, differs from that of Calvin. Now, Knox also gives us a few of the doctrine behind it in a statement on the true doctrine of the Lord's Supper. I'm not going to that, of course, fascinating too, but there Knox uh, reminds us of the action of Christ in the sacrament. He sees the supper as Christ's action, representing himself to us, giving himself to us, asking us to remember his death and his passion, and remember, reminding us, that we are one family, members one of another at the one common table, and also of the perpetuity of the church because of the words, until he comes. There will always be a church until he comes. But the order itself is intriguing. Knox would preach and pray at the end of the sermon and then give the exhortation and uh, he would in the course of the ex exhortation of the week he would call uh, the fencing of the table he would excommunicate their body those who were living in sin. It wasn't fierce and it wasn't a novelty. In fact, there is an even fiercer form of words in Lord's liturgy, which is extraordinary. But it was there that excommunication. But there was also this this sacrament is comfort for poor sick souls. So a poor sick soul must not stay away, but must come to get comfort from this ordinance. And then the minister came down from the pulpit, and the pulpit always elevated, not because the man in it was important, but because the word in it was important. And so let people see your lips. And your eyes in the case, but above all, let them know the authoritative nature. We heard about Calvin's proof, but this morning, it's not about my being humble, it's about the word being dominant over the whole furniture of the church. And Knox came down, and he, he would sit at the table. He sat at a table. There had to be a table. No altar, no sacrifice, but a table, a meal, a supper. And he would then, uh, he would uh, pray and ask God's blessing, but if I may again digress for a moment, there was no epicrasis in Knox's prayer at this point, epicrasis, epicario, calling down the spirit on the word. Knox did not very much approve of any suggestion that there could be a change in the bread and the wine themselves. He would not have allowed the, the former words used in, in our diary for, for public worship yeah, that we change this, the, the bread from a, a, a common to a holy use. There's no such language in Oxford, nor would there be in my former service. There's no epic places in it at all. The, the blessing is on the heart, not on the elements. But more important, the people then sat at the table beside the minister, same table, all equal, all same level. And he broke the bread and he took it. And the others passed along the table one to the other. That was it. Uh, the simplest possible arrangement, uh, the minister there sitting, the same level as all the other shared, sharing at the table with them. And uh, then afterwards the prayer of thanksgiving. Now I've been doing my, my brain to work out some closing words on this. Knox as inspiration, his position and calling and talent so different from ours. 
and when Knox dies. The church is in a bad way in Scotland, 1572, Knox dies. That same year, after Knox's labours, what we have, we have the, the read statement of episcopacy. That's the news that comes more or less on Knox's deathbed. And from that point onwards, please, be careful in talking of Scotland as a Christian nation. It was never a thoroughly Christianized nation or a thoroughly Calvinistic one. That matter even less. After Knox comes Melville, dies in exile in France. After whom comes Robert Bruce, Barnes met him to the north of Scotland. And then the covenant which King Charles II bring in his Charles I with his prayer book and his episcopacy. The covenanting struggle of the slaughter of the killing times. Then the 18th century, the moderates, and the transformation of our landscape by the, the by the movement of people from the villages, the rural parishes, to the urban areas, and the church doesn't follow them. And we have the quick emergence of pagan schemes and pagan slums besides sometimes cathedrals. When was this? You have the horrific conditions in Blackfriars in the days of Thomas Chalmers. We days and nights in the wines of Edinburgh. The incestuousness and the apples and prostitution and so on was on in this Christian land. So look, we have never operated in ideal situations. I don't think it was ever any better than it is today, or any any easier than it is today. What thing can I give by way of salvation of this man who was so uh, <coughs> himself in all his good points and so like me in all his bad points? And all I can say is just repeat to you the words of the Regent Morton at Knox's funeral. There, he says, lies a man who never feared the face of man. You all know the quote. Take it to heart. But the men and women you don't fear love and respect them nonetheless.